is a long-term plan as well as a short-term uh, set of guidelines uh, to try to move things forward. As Brooke has identified, a big chunk of this is financial um, because of the heavy lift financially for the work that has to be done. Now, we have recommended in here a grant program a state, uh, for state and localities to be matched by the federal government, probably two local dollars for every one federal. That is a non-starter in the current congressional climate with the state revolving fund program uh, cut, I think, by 16 percent in the latest round. We recognize that, but that's not a reason not to put out that long-term vision. The alternative, uh, one of the alternatives is uh, state and local uh, revenue bonds or uh, specific bonds, general obligation bonds to go forward, which are uh, federally tax exempt. That's a way to stretch out things a little bit further to make the local jurisdictions better able to handle it. There are bonding issues here in D.C. in terms of how much additional general obligation uh, bonding can be issued, uh, but the local jurisdictions in Maryland have a little bit more authority there. In the short term, what we have recommended on that, uh, in, in addition to the grant and uh, the debt obligation approach, uh, we have also recommended, because of uh, federal tax incentives, and in specific, there are about 120,000 single-family homes. Uh, in the watershed, which is quite a large number. It's a significant chunk of the impervious surface. And while we can expect commercial and uh, industrial areas to be redeveloped uh, in the economic lifetime we're talking about here, single-family homes are less likely to be systematically redeveloped in the same fashion. So if we're going to get uh, retrofits out there, and keep in mind that most of the watershed development was pre-regulatory, um, we're going to have to go out on the individual basis and do, get people to do things voluntarily because it's not realistic to expect folks to go out and issue a separate permit to each single family home. That's a long stretch. By the same token, what we have found uh, in the energy tax area is that, uh, particularly on the energy efficiency uh, tax side, those programs tended to be well, relatively well accepted and reasonably successful in getting a lot of uh, better, more efficient technology out there. So the idea here is to issue for single-family homeowners, for those residents, um, federal tax credits that will be, in turn, incentivize folks to move forward and make the retrofits that are needed. These would be things like uh, pervious pavement for driveways, for sidewalks, um, green roofs may be a kind of a stretch for single-family home, depending, rain gardens, things of that nature that can be done that are a relatively small percentage of the value of a particular, uh, particular home or residential property. Now, we have recommended in the report that this is, uh, be tied to the local jurisdictions adopting more stringent regulations so that you have a local incentive, a local constituency to adopt the tougher rules uh, and people who will push back because they have a financial stake in the outcome. We've also made clear in the report that any federal tax policy here needs not only to identify and prioritize people going in and putting in the better technology, the retrofits at their homes, but also in the maintenance. Because one of the things that came through very clearly from our engineering colleagues is you can have low maintenance techniques, high maintenance techniques, but there is no technique which, if not maintained, will continue to work properly. And that kind of regular attention needs to be also incentivized in these programs as well. So that uh, is part of what we're after on the tax incentive side. The other piece of that, we're pushing in here to try to get people large commercial properties that have large impervious areas to go back and retrofit and put in uh, pervious parking lots and put in the measures needed there. If we are successful in getting people to retrofit, what that means is that we will be taking a lot of property out of service before its useful life is, economic life is finished. Uh, there are some fairly complex depreciation rules in the federal tax code for that sort of thing. 
we would want that, acceler that depreciation to be accelerated so that people don't take a financial bath as they do it, and also probably to have accelerated depreciation on the newer techniques because they're a little less proven and you want to sweeten the pot for the folks who you're trying to get to install those new measures. So those would be um, measures we're also recommending. Just for your reference, in the short run, what we have recommended, what we're seeking in the next 18 months, are folks under getting the federal government to understate feasibility studies on specific techniques um, and how this might be structured uh, beyond what I've just described uh, to move it forward. So uh, the tax incentives are an important part, especially to get it out to the private landowners uh, and uh, to commercial property owners. We've talked some about revenue sources. Everybody is cash strapped at this point, all your local jurisdictions as well as the federal government. But among the things that have been identified, uh, the local jurisdictions in Maryland have not by and large adopted a stormwater fee similar in structure to what the district has, which will go up with time and which in turn also gives some incentives for people to retrofit. Right now in Montgomery County it's an ad valorem tax. Uh, there is room for raising considerably greater revenue through that mechanism. We've also recommended, and this may be overtaken by events, but we had recommended potentially looking at excise taxes on things like lawn care chemicals, on things like pesticides, and things such as impervious building materials. That would be helpful if you run sort of back of the envelope numbers on that, if you can figure a million cubic yards of concrete a year, and, you know, look at some of the prices, 10 bucks a ton, you're probably looking at maybe 10 million a year. Helpful, but hardly enough to carry you all the way through. So those are among the incentives and the revenue issues that we have explained here. Uh, what you'll find in the report is that we have not, by and large, recommended a lot of additional new regulations. It's not so much that the regulations on new development are deficient. Uh, the, certainly the permits that EPA has proposed are, are fairly aggressive uh, at this point. But it's redevelopment that needs to be focused on, and it is getting those things to be fully carried out and getting the funding for them that may be more of an impediment. Now, we've, we've talked about the financial side that you see here. Uh, I'm going to close out talking on the toxic side. But on the stormwater side, we've also recommended uh, a much more aggressive approach to federal facilities within the area. Uh, EPA is trying to, uh, and has recommended in its permit, a fairly aggressive level of control at federal facilities, which is one, a 1 1.7 inch uh, control on site of that, uh, of that rainfall, 1.7 inch storm. And they're getting a lot of pushback from DOD. Part of that, I'm told, is that uh, DOD is is as much concerned about the impact in the rest of the United States uh, as it is about this kind of, uh, of these installations. But it's a, a delicate um, battle going on between them right now. I'd like to see how that comes out. Uh, we've talked some about incentives. Uh, folks have asked us, well, what about, you know, tax reductions and so forth. And what we've gotten back from the development community has actually been somewhat interesting. The, the amount of tax relief that could be provided, first of all, the local jurisdictions are quite hostile to the idea of relief at all in their current situation. But the local residents have also, developers have also identified that it would probably be a greater incentive uh, for their activities uh, to have streamlined permitting uh, than it would be to have uh, necessarily property tax relief of various kinds. And part of the reason for that is that when you're a developer, you're ordinarily working with borrowed money. So every day of delay is another day of interest payments. So if you can streamline uh, things and make, for example, one-stop uh, permitting where all of it is put together, uh, you may do uh, a lot better. And we've suggested the one-stop permitting as opposed to setting deadlines and permits uh, because one thing I've never found that putting a, a written deadline into a permit is actually all that helpful. 
uh, for people to process it because by the time you get it in front of somebody who can give the order, you've already used up all that time and then some. Uh, but if you structure it such that the permits all go to one location, uh, centralized, you may do a little bit better on that. We've also been told there's some perverse incentives in the current permitting system. For example, if you want to repave your parking lot, you may not need to get any permit to do it. Uh, however, if you want to install a permeable parking lot uh, where you're doing some excavation, you do need a bunch of permits. And those incentives are backwards because it means you've got to go to a lot more trouble to put it back right than to put it back the same old way that's creating the stormwater issues. So those are some of the issues that I've talked about. Let me close out talking about our toxics uh, issue. What the TMDL, uh, the total maximum daily load, the pollution diet for the river shows is that for PCBs, even if not another molecule goes into the river, we won't meet the standards. There is enough there, it is persistent enough uh, that we don't meet standards currently. There are PCBs in the river sediments. There are a number of other toxics, including polyaromatic hydrocarbons, very common. Um, you also have a bunch of uh, old pesticides haven't been legally sold in this country for 30 years or more. But we have all of those out there, as well as uh, metals for various kinds of uh, manufacturing. As Brooke noted, you can't really go after that under the current Clean Water Act, because we don't have really much in the way, or any, current discharges that you could go after with the permit in effect. And in order to reach this, your legal uh, resources really boil down to going after it under Superfund. What I have recommended and what we wound up doing in this report is to say that if we do the same old approach that we use in Superfund, we're going to be fragmented, slow, and not necessarily effective in what we do. Because what ordinarily happens is that when a site is placed on the national priority list, there's then a set of lengthy studies related to the site, and only as the last stage does one get around to dealing with natural resource damages. Uh, and at this location, in the Anacostia, our primary stressors, our primary problems that have been detected are ecological. It's the fish with the tumors, concern about things biomagnifying up the food chain, things of that nature. So what we have recommended here, instead of doing it site by site on the shore side, that instead, and instead of waiting until all of this shoreside remediation is completed, which would be the business as usual approach, that instead we get try to get a single estuary-wide remedial investigation and feasibility study, RIFS, and it combine that with the natural resource damages assessment. That is not the ordinary course here in, in Superfund. But there's solid reasons to do it that way here. The estuary is a single system. The critters move back and forth, the tidal waters move back and forth, and to some degree the contaminants move back and forth. There's been enough dredging, other disruption, and so forth that you can't really link particular concentrations of contaminants, or at least it's much harder to do that to a particular shoreside location. And it would make sense, given that we have this very comprehensive restoration report that was done by the partnership of what it will take to do to mitigate some of these wildlife impacts, we already have projects set, it would make sense to do an estuary-wide study, to do it soon, uh, instead of doing these fragmented things, and to combine it so that in four or five years, you have a workable blueprint to go forward. By that time, you will be close to completing the long-term control plan. Um, you will not be recontaminating sediments, particularly from that source. Uh, and you have a reasonable shot of getting greater participation, because at that point, uh, you'll have a plan that says, all right, we know we need to cap this much, we need to dredge that much, and we can let X amount naturally attenuate and here are the restoration projects upstream or nearby which we can engage in moving forward. If we don't do something like that, it will be probably not in this decade when we have any kind of 
sediment cleanup, and certainly not on a, on a uh, estuary-wide basis. One of the other difficulties we have with this particular estuary, as you folks know, is it, it's very shallow. And when you're dealing with capping, you're usually not just putting a, a layer of soil on top the way you might in a shoreside installation. You ordinarily do your capping with heavy stone, and a lot of it. Uh, if you do that here, you might as well plant grass on top of it, because you will end up essentially filling more of, the, of it. And we have some fairly real uh, flood issues when you've got the uh, main stem uh, narrowed as much as you have. Uh, that also have to be balanced. So doing it on an estuary-wide basis, you may come to a very different set of conclusions than you might if you did it site by site in the same old fashion. With that, I'm going to stop since I think we've been talking for a little over half an hour and I think we should open it for questions.